Hola, buenas, buenas tardes a todos y a todas y bienvenidas a esta sesión de, de, bueno, esta sesión de conferencias o a esta serie de conferencias que desde el MACBA, el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Barcelona, hemos preparado en relación a la exposición de Félix González Torres, la exposición retrospectiva, comisariada por Tania Barson, la comisaria en jefe del museo y comisaria de este proyecto, sobre el trabajo de Félix González Torres o en torno al trabajo de Félix González Torres, eh, política de la relación. Eh, hoy nos, eh, estamos aquí online porque finalmente por las restricciones sanitarias derivadas de la pandemia del COVID no hemos podido realizarla en el, en el MACUA, en el museo, en las instalaciones del museo de manera presencial y por eso no ha podido acompañarnos Joshua Chambers Lesson, a quien me gustaría dar la bienvenida. Welcome Joshua to, to, this, to this panel or to this lecture today. Uh, y, y bueno, hoy es la segunda de las conferencias de este ciclo en el que lo que queríamos hacer o lo que nos proponíamos era aproximarnos al trabajo de Félix González Torres a través de cuatro aspectos que nos parecían interesantes en relación a la exposición. La semana pasada la comisaria en jefe del museo, Tania Barson, hizo ya una presentación en la que podía, podíamos ver el recorrido de, de, de la exposición, de la muestra y la aproximación desde eh, su propuesta curatorial, ¿no? que en el caso de, de Félix González Torres es, es fundamental ¿no? el trabajo de la comisaria y de la adaptación de cada uno de los proyectos al espacio eh, expositivo o a cada iteración de, 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 de la exposición. Para hoy, eh, para nosotras era importante invitar a, a alguien como Joshua Chambers Lesson, cuya investigación se ha adentrado en algunos de los aspectos que nos interesaba aproximarnos en este seminario, como eran la cuestión de la performatividad del trabajo de, de Félix González Torres o su condición queer y brown, ¿no? algo que ha desarrollado extensamente, extensamente Joshua Chambers Lesson en, su, en sus investigaciones, o también la cuestión del amor queer, ¿no? que es algo en lo que hoy se adentrará, eh, se, se adentrará Joshua Chambers Lesson. También hay algo que nos interesaba especialmente de la práctica o del trabajo de Joshua Chambers Lesson, es cómo eh, es, eh, parte de su trabajo está muy inspirado, muy cercano, a, 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 la, a la aproximación que hizo al trabajo de Félix González Torres José Esteban Muñoz, ¿no? con conceptos tan fundamentales como el de desidentificación o en relación también a un, a un libro que acaba de ser traducido al castellano por la editorial argentina Caja Negra y que ha tenido, se ha expandido como la pólvora entre las, entre las lectoras castellano parlantes o hispano parlantes como es Cruising Utopia, ¿no? que, en el que le dedica también un capítulo porque eh, eh, José Esteban Muñoz visitó de manera recurrente el trabajo de, el trabajo de, de Félix. Para la, la sesión de hoy, eh, Joshua ha, ha preparado una, una conferencia que tiene que ver con objetos de pérdida, amor queer, en relación al trabajo de Félix González Torres. Joshua Chambers Lesos es profesor de estudios performativos y de estudios de Asia y América de la, de la Universidad de Northwestern y ha publicado una extensa obra sobre arte contemporáneo y performance, teoría crítica de la raza y queer of color. ¿no? Y es autor de After Party, a manifesto for queer of color life, en el que justamente dedica uno de sus capítulos a Félix González Torres, ¿no? que es en relación al marxismo ¿no? o, a la, o a la relación del trabajo de Félix con el marxismo, u otros libros como eh, A Race So Different, Low and Performance in Asia and America, ¿no? eh, publicado en 2013. Junto a Tavian Ñongo, acaba de publicar una obra póstuma de José Esteban Muñoz, The Sense of Brown, ¿no? que justamente fue publicado el año pasado, en 2020, por Duke University Press. Eh, para todos los que nos estáis siguiendo desde casa, comentaros dos cosas. Que la primera que eh, en, el, en la parte baja, los que nos estáis siguiendo desde Zoom, en la parte baja del, del menú veréis una, un, un logo que es el de interpretación y en el que podréis seguirnos tanto en castellano como lo, probablemente lo estéis haciendo ahora en mi caso o en inglés, eh, eh, si queréis traducción en inglés. Y en el caso reverso, si queréis escuchar la, la, la conferencia de Joshua en castellano, tendréis que poner ES. Si, podéis, si queréis escucharlo en, en bilingüe, a mí en castellano y a Joshua Chambers-Lesson, no hace falta que, que, que toquéis nada. 
Eh, una vez acabemos con la presentación de Joshua, abriremos el turno a preguntas y comentarios. Para ello tenéis dos herramientas. Los que nos estáis siguiendo desde Zoom podéis eh, hacer preguntas en el, en el, tanto en el, en el chat ¿no? y, en la, y, en, y en la sección de preguntas y respuestas. Y para quienes nos seguís en YouTube podéis hacerlo en el canal de, de preguntas de YouTube. Yo no me extiendo nada más. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Joshua, for being today with, with us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Pablo. Um, thank you so much, Pablo, for uh, both. Uh, are you able to hear me? Can you hear? Okay, good. Sorry. Um, thank you so much, Pablo, for the introduction um, and for the invitation to join you today. And I also want to thank Tanya Barr, um, uh, who curated uh, the exhibition as well as Yolanda Nicolás, um, who has been working uh, with me. Uh, very hard to try to get me there in person. Um, we, unfortunately, our timing was off by just a little bit as the borders sort of reopened um, just after this was all settled in and planned. So I'm very much with you in spirit today, um, if not in person. Um, and I also wanna give thanks to the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation for um, assisting a little bit with the presentation, um, including um, some of the images that you'll be seeing today and Holly McHugh and Katrina Harpo um, were both exceptionally helpful on that front. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen now and sort of jump into this. Um, let's see, play. Okay. Um, so I've been asked to speak today for about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, and um, uh, the vast majority of this material is new material, new thinking on Felix, but some of you may uh, recognize a few passages here and there from um, some previous thinking I've done if you've had the ill fortune to encounter some of that work. So I'll just get started. Untitled, Placebo, 1991. Across the floor, a spill of candy. Felix Gonzalez Torres' untitled placebo from 1991. This oceanic expanse of individually wrapped candies, candies wrapped in silver foil, is shimmering. With an ideal weight of around a thousand pounds, the sculpture is mutable, transforming over time, destroying itself, disappearing as spectators take pieces of candy with them, remaking it, consuming it, until the candy is later replenished by the gallery. In the background, Gonzalez Torres's untitled lover boy, consisting of blue sheets with varying dimensions, a tension between the soothing blue of a lover and the seductive betrayal of the placebo's promise to heal. Romance, seduction, love, and death all wrapped up around each other. Untitled placebo was first exhibited as pictured here at Andrea Rosen Gallery in New York in 1991 as part of a one month solo exhibition titled Every Week is Something Different, emphasizing the ephemeral nature of his work in which the pieces materialize and destroy themselves or are constituted on the precipice of a precarious dissolve. The artist brought new works into the gallery every week Untitled Placebo was on display for five days at the end of the month. The show opened on May 2nd, 1991, just over three months after the death of the artist partner, Ross Laycock from AIDS. A few years later in an interview with the artist, Tim Rollins, Gonzalez Torres would describe Untitled Placebo and the aesthetics of love and destruction bound up in and uh, as bound up within and tethered to Ross's death. There was no other consideration involved, except that I wanted to make an artwork that could disappear, that never existed. And it was a metaphor for when Ross was dying. So it was a metaphor that I would abandon this work before the work abandoned me. I'm going to destroy it before it destroys me. That was my little amount of power when it came to this work. I didn't want it to last because then it couldn't hurt me. The published interview indicates that the interview between Rollins and Gonzalez Torres took place in the artist's apartment. It doesn't say anything about what the apartment was like, but in 1999, about five years after Gonzalez Torres's own death from AIDS, the artist was featured in a book of fashion photographer David Seidner's photographs of artists in their studios, and his apartment is at the center of the segment. Seidner died of AIDS in 1999, just before the book was published, and his entry on Gonzalez Torres is an elegy of loss and love. 
Felix Gonzalez Torres lived in a one bedroom apartment in Chelsea, Seidner wrote, and the entire world was his studio. He ambled through the space like a big kid. Everything was spotlessly ordered with nothing out of place. Everywhere was brightness and color like some enormous overgrown playground. The apartment was chock full of colorful plastic toys of cartoon characters popular during his childhood. In the place of photographs of Gonzalez Torres' studio, Seidner gives us intimate glimpses of his apartment, a detail of a shelf covered in toys and figurines, as well as two photographs of Gonzalez Torres in what I imagine to be his bed. In one, he looks at the camera with one of his cats, perhaps one of the cats Ross left him, tucked under his arm. Both cats and artists raise their gaze to confront the camera's gaze. He loved the cat in this picture, Seidner observes. This is not the only index of love in the spread, as the image appears opposite a photograph of Gonzalez Torres's seminal Untitled 1991, a billboard erected in the wake of Ross's death and featuring an empty bed with the imprint of two bodies. The billboard was erected in 24 sites around New York City, with the number 24 referencing the date of Ross's death on January 24th. Felix was obsessed with the loss of his lover, Seidner writes. But instead of holding on to anger or resentment, he forged ahead, making all of his work a paean to love. This word, love, appears often in Seidner's narrative, as when he writes that to know Felix was to love him. In an autobiographical sketch published with the Rollins interview in 93, Felix makes his first mention of Ross um, and ties it to the year 1983 with the reference to Boy Bar, possibly a bar they met in. They were together until Ross's death from AIDS in 1991. As Seidner's text suggests, Laycock's death had a profound effect on Gonzalez Torres, and the artist often invoked his fallen love in interviews and in his work. In the interview with Rollins, for example, the first recorded response by Felix begins by acknowledging his love for uh, his love affair with Ross. Rollins asks him how long he's been to the movies as a first question, and Gonzalez Torres re replies succinctly, two and a half years. I used to go to the movies with Ross. And it was about two and a half years since Ross had died. Um, later in the interview, Gonzalez Torres invokes one of his favorite films, 1959's Hiroshima Mon Amour, directed by Alain Resnay, with a script by Marguerite Dura. And again, he invokes Ross. Love and fear seem to be the two great themes of your work, Rollins prompts. It's very funny you say that, Gonzalez Torres replies, because I was just thinking earlier, I mentioned Hiroshima Mon Amour. It took me a really long time to understand the opening sequence. The female character says, you are good for me because you destroy me. I finally understand what that means. You can be destroyed because of love and as a fear of, and as a result of fear, Love is very peculiar because it gives a reason to live, but it's also a great reason to be afraid, to be extremely afraid, to be terrified of losing that love. This emphasis on loving something that can destroy you, love as an attachment to something or someone so profound that the loss of them or their love could destroy you, this emphasis on love and destruction would be a major theme in Gonzalez Torres's work. Gonzalez Torres presents work to fall in love with, only to watch it withdraw from being. Spills of candy are offered up to the spectator, slowly diminishing and disappearing as they are taken away, perhaps mirroring the diminishing or wasting of a body made sick with AIDS. Stacks of paper similarly diminished as they are consumed, billboards of birds in flight or a ghostly empty bed proliferating throughout a city or space before disappearing to the ages. Ephemeral sculptural events that exist only so long as they are materialized or as long as someone takes the time and performs the labor and care necessary to reproduce and maintain them, all slipping away from presence, withdrawing into absence, disappearing and dying before us, destroying themselves in their materialization and our consumption of them. This is to suggest that many of his works can be understood as performances, durational events that occur within a given time and place between bodies present. Certainly, Gonzalez Torres was drawing upon the tradition of conceptual art, such as the work of his interlocutor, Joseph Kasuth, 
where many pieces like performances only exist so long as they're materialized and exhibited. But he was also deploying an appropriation of minimalism that embraced a queer degree of theatricality, one that refuted the straight, macho, murderous identity of the white male minimalist sculptor. Rather than running from the forms of theatricality that critic Michael Fried accused minimalist sculpture of exhibiting, Gonzalez Torres embraced performance and theatricality within the work. He often drew on the traditions of modernist performance, Bertolt Brecht in particular, but also Antonin Artaud, to ground his work. And indeed, his work often functions more like scripts than enduring objects, as an exhibiting party receives specifications about how to materialize the work, but makes primary choices about how to direct, display, and produce it in the time and space of the exhibition. Staging his work as and in performance, Gonzalez Torres's work taps into performance's proximity to death. Uh, as explicitly articulated in works like Untitled, Death by Gun, a paper stack in which Gonzalez Torres gives away sheets of paper printed with the faces and stories of US Americans killed by gunshot in a finite period of time. I am reminded here of performance theorist Peggy Phelan's assertion that performance's only life is in the present. For Phelan, performance only exists within the space and time of lived experience. It is unrepeatable and becomes itself by withdrawing into absence. From this vantage, performance dies and withdraws from the realm of the living in order to become itself such that every performance carries with it and within it a confrontation with loss and with death. Every photograph of a performance in turn is a document of the performance's passage from presence into absence for death. Roland Bart, um, a patron saint of queer melancholy, similarly framed photography as an encounter with death marked by theatricality. It was the relation with death that made photography of all the arts the most like performance for Bart. And this is a Bart quote. If photography seems to me closer to the theater, it is by way of a singular intermediary, and perhaps I am the only one who sees it by way of death. That's the end of the quote. Across a, across a wide range of cultures from antiquity to the present, theater, ritual, and performance have mediated the gap between the realm of the living and the dead. Yet Felix's mobilization of performance within his work refused a politics of nihilism that would give itself over purely to the realm of death. Assuming it is true that performance stages an encounter with death or dying, it is also true that the encounter with performance can be a way of keeping the dead alive with the living. For the late queer theorist Jose Munoz, a scholar of Gonzalez Torres's work, performance leaves behind queer traces of lived experiences, feelings, memories, and other ephemera that can be reanimated to extend a performance's life into a future beyond its seeming end. Performance has the power to preserve, maintain, and weakly resurrect the memory of the dead, making it a powerful means for sustaining queer of color life in the face of annihilation. It is at this axis that I am suggesting Gonzalez Torres's work functions, allowing us to confront the simultaneity of love and loss, queer life and death within a single encounter. In performance, time folds, bends, extends and rebounds as the present is delivered into the past or as the future takes hold in the present. And as Sandra Ruiz, a performance theorist has taught us, performance's queer and anti-colonial sense of temporality allows for the reorganization of linear notions of time, i.e. in effect straight, white and colonial time in order to facilitate the rearrangement and birth of other possibilities beyond and past the finitude of life lived on a linear trajectory towards death as racialized, colonized, queer, trans, and femme life is sometimes and often lived. There is a degree to which loving Felix is to come to terms with the loss of him, and this is the thing that I want us to linger on during our time together today the degree to which love and loss are interarticulated and the peculiar nature in which queer love and loss in particular are folded together. Living and creating work during an era of mass death, homophobia, xenophobia, and virulently racist white nationalisms, Felix Gonzalez Torres's work staged the entanglements between queer and brown love and loss. So in our time together, 
I want to ask what it means to love Gonzalez Torres and his work and to consider the ways in which one might gain a sense and experience of queer love and loss with the encounter with it. What follows is less a scholarly account of Gonzalez Torres's work than it is a series of love stories woven into a love story, a story about falling in love with Gonzalez Torres, about learning about queer love and loss from Gonzalez Torres's work, and a story about the dynamics of love and loss in Gonzalez Torres's work and life with Ross. Untitled, Still Life, 1989. It wasn't just the spills of candy that would disappear, monuments of loss and wasting. There are also the paper stacks in which printed materials are given away to the spectator, destroyed in their distribution. The best known stacks typically have a larger poster size dimension, such as Untitled Death by Gun shown earlier. Untitled Still Life from 1989 is more modest, however, with standard office paper dimensions, ideally eight and a half by 11 inches. A play on the tradition of still life portraiture, Gonzalez Torres strings together a series of dates and references to paint what may be a portrait of his life with Ross. Red Canoe, 1987, Paris, 1985, Harry the Dog, 1983, Blue Lake, 1987, Interferon, 1989, Ross, 1984. The paper stack bore a familiar resemblance to a 1989 piece, Untitled, which featured many of the same references. Instead of being printed on paper, however, that piece was installed on the wall of the Brooklyn Museum of New York in the tradition of Gonzalez Torres's dateline portraits. Still life might be more than an art historical reference here. It is an insistent prayer, freezing a period of time into a portrait in which both lovers, Felix and Ross, are still here and still alive, together and with each other. The word still, a subtle reminder of the precarious nature of living queer in the first wave of the AIDS pandemic. Indeed, still here suggests a reorganization of time, one, um, one that doesn't necessarily have to move towards death. The dates also refuse a linear uh, order, refusing straight time and opting instead for the queerness of relational association. One can piece together moments from Felix and Ross's life in this portrait. Red Canoe and Blue Lake seem to reference Ross and Felix's trip to Wawanaisa, a beach resort area of Lake Huron, together with Ross's dog, Harry, who, as Felix recorded in his own autobiographical self-portrait, spends his time at the lake retrieving every boy he sees. Shortly after Ross's death, Gonzalez Torres would create a portrait made from a photograph of Ross playing at the beach with Harry, printed, uh, playing at a beach with Harry, printed in the fragile form of a puzzle, untitled Ross and Harry, 1991. In Untitled Still Life, the reference to Paris seemingly notes Felix's first summer with Ross during their trip to Europe in 1985. And finally, Interferon seems to reference a 1989 study indicating that beta interferon might be a useful treatment for HIV infection, a ray of hope in what was a bleakening health landscape for the two lovers. Felix loved so many people, and so many people loved Felix, Ross, his gallerist Andrea Rosen, his friend Julie Alt. The list goes on, and for some time. Think of Seidner's note, to know Felix was to love him. As in Untitled Still Life, his work commonly references these many intimacies, these many love affairs, as Ross, as other beloved friends, family members, and lovers appear in direct or oblique ways throughout his repertoire. His subtle routine deployment of the story of self in his work makes it easy to feel a kind of closeness to him. And I often see in students, friends, artists, and colleagues that when they speak of Felix, they do so affectionately, carefully, and even lovingly. We claim a kind of familiarity to him that we can't in fact claim, except that he was constantly giving himself away to us and giving himself away to the world. This familiarity is reflected in an essay affectionately called My Felix, where the artist Glenn Ligon narrates his presumed intimacy with the artist in this way. I didn't know Felix Gonzalez Torres. Felix Gonzalez Torres wasn't a friend of mine, and I'm no Felix Gonzalez Torres. But Felix is the artist that artists of my generation feel on a first name basis with. It is his interviews and writings that we pass along to students, his work that we make pilgrimages to see, 
his passing that we most deeply mourn. Following Ligon, to love Felix, we have always had to deeply mourn him. There was the fact that, for many of us, he was this impossible thing attained, a queer person of color whose work mounted an effective critique of the ideology and systems of the dominant culture from within, of the corruption of American politics. He fashioned himself as a virus, an imposter, an infiltrator, reproducing a radical model for other ways of being in the world from within. He was trenchant in his critiques of capitalism, while nonetheless manipulating the market to forward his aesthetic and political agenda. He offered a blueprint for navigating a hostile world in which being queer or being Latinx marked and framed one's life chances with mortal consequences. And in the face of such limits, he sought out the revenge of a life well-lived embracing the embrace of his lover, even if this love affair would inevitably end in the crushing storm of great loss. Art historian Miwan Kwan offers an elegant framing of this sense of intimacy, opening what is, I think, still one of the most beautiful things ever written about the artist, with a modest disclosure that marks both Kwan's sense of intimacy with him and the distance that she feels from him. I never met FGT. It is surprising that we never did meet since we knew so many people in common, some very close to each of us. In confronting the task of writing about his art now, which seems impossible to do without trying to remember the artist, I thus find myself in an odd position of feeling very close to and even a part of his world and at some time being completely alien from it. I only have other people's memories, other people's stories. Then in looking at his art, I'm forced to ask myself, is it possible to miss someone that one never met, to feel the loss of something one never had? One grieves those things that we have lost, but we also grieve the things we never had a chance to lose. This is one of the queer dynamics constantly at play in Gonzalez Torres's work. To encounter his work, to fall in love with his work, is to fall in love with him to some extent. And this is always to be plunged deeper into the knowledge that he is gone and not to return. One is falling in love with a ghost, a trace and a remnant. I wonder if some of us love him so much because this encounter with loving as losing is one of the lessons that his work teaches us, a lesson that many of us, especially queer people and people of color need to be able to learn to function in a world that can be harsh and unforgiving. The lesson is this, to be able to learn to love, we have to learn how to lose. I want to return here to something Gonzalez Torres said to Rollins, and this is a quote, love is very peculiar because it gives a reason to live, but it also gives a great reason to be afraid, to be extremely afraid, to be terrified of losing that love. Why afraid? Because in losing the thing that one loves, one might lose the self. This is what literary theorist Shoshana Feldman calls the very scandal of the lover's promise due to what she describes as, and this is a quote, the incongruous but indissoluble relation between language and the body, which reveals the scandal of seduction of the human body insofar as it speaks, the scandal of the promise of love insofar as this promise is par excellence, the promise that cannot be kept. For Feldman, a lover's promise is always predicated on the possibility that it may file, fail or misfire. The fact that the lover's promise might fail, that the love might not endure, that the lover might go away or withdraw their love or that they might die is part of what charges a lover's promise with such power and intensity. Part of what sparks desire or the feeling of want for the lover is the unbearable thought that they might be lost. We want to be closer, one might want to be closer to the love object, feel the desire to draw it closer towards and even into the self, having something to do with the knowledge or the fear that the love object may yet be lost, might skip out on its promise and could leave one shattered in the wake of its leaving. This is all to suggest that a part of what makes love love is the integration of the love object into a lover's sense of self, when you integrate the thing you love into you, you may have to admit that yourself might not now survive the loss of the love object. Stevie Nicks's landslide 
is a pretty good account of precisely this problem when she sings that I've been afraid of changing because I've built my life around you. Under such circumstances, there is the very real possibility or sense that you might not survive the loss of the love object. And there is also the gutting knowledge that even if you do survive the loss, you will likely not survive as the same person. Grief changes a person into something or someone new. Loss can be a foundational component of any love relation. And as Gonzalez Torres' work teaches us, there is a degree to which the potential for love's failure and the experience of grief that comes when love does fail is a reminder of the inevitability of death. Committing to love in the present is a commitment to grieving in the future. As the psychoanalyst Joan Riviere wrote, death and grief are intimately woven together with love. It is our first experience of something like death, a recognition of the non-existence of something, of an overwhelming loss, both in ourselves and in others, as it seems. And this experience brings an awareness of love in the form of desire and a recognition of dependence in the form of need. At the same moment as, and inextricably bound up with feeling and uncontrollable sensations of pain and threatened destruction within and without. The love relation is a terrifying one from this perspective because it exposes the lovers to the inescapability of dependence, want, loss, and ultimately death. To love in the time that we are still alive is to face the inevitability of our eventual loss of each other and of ourselves. Untitled Lover Boy, 1988. Gonzalez Torres narrated his work as a confrontation with precisely the unthinkable and impossible, a confrontation with the loss of love and with queer love as loss. In an interview with Nancy Spector in preparation for his storied posthumous 1995 retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, a show that later toured to Santiago, Chile, Paris, and Berlin in 1996, he remarked, Freud said that we rehearse our fears in order to lessen them. In a way, this letting go of the work, this refusal to make a static form, a monolithic sculpture in favor of a disappearing, changing, unstable and fragile form was an attempt on my part to rehearse my fears of having Ross disappear day by day, right in front of my eyes. One can read so much of the work referring to Ross as a confrontation with the loss of Ross, but also as an attempt to keep Ross together and with Felix to make more Ross just as he was dying. By his own account, Felix and Ross lived a full life during their years together. Felix was born in Guaymaro, Cuba in 1957, Laycock a few years later in Canada in 1959. Felix was sent to Spain and later Puerto Rico as a child, growing up to study at the prestigious Universidad de Puerto Rico, exposing him to and embroiling him within Puerto Rico's rich cultural and historical political history of avant-garde performance, conceptual art, as well as the decolonial tradition of graphic design as a model of political agitation, which one can see throughout his work. He exhibited early work on the archipelago before moving northward to Miami first and finally New York, where he largely lived until his death in 1994. And I believe he died in Miami, although I could be wrong about that. Um, both Canadian and US immigration law refused to recognize Felix and Ross's relationship. So they were mostly forced to live apart during their years together stealing moments when they could. In 1985, they spent their first summer together and reflecting on uh, the next year, 1986, Gonzalez described um, Blue Kitchen, Blue Flowers in Toronto, a real home for the first time in so long, so long, Ross is here. The sanctity of their home was contingent on the will of a manifestly set of homophobic states. In 1986, for example, a US Supreme Court ruling upheld the legality of laws banning gay sex, essentially rendering null queer claims, claims to bodily autonomy, or even the right to engage in consensual sex within the boundaries of one's home with the partners of one's choice. This was also the beginning of a period of profound personal loss as Gonzalez Torres's mother died in 1986 of leukemia, just as the AIDS crisis raged through New York and Toronto. Both Gonzalez Torres and Laycock contracted HIV. As the decade turned, Ross's disease advanced. He became sicker. Felix began rehearsing his partner's death years before this. 
In the mid eighties, he began to experiment with the use of puzzles made from images drawn from a range of sources, many of his own personal archive. In one of the earliest puzzle, uh, puzzle pieces, 1988's Untitled Lover Boy, Gonzalez Torres directed links to the puzzle's aesthetics of fragility and disillusion to his own love story. The parenthetical reference lover boy suggests a relationship to the man in the picture, Ross. Here, masculinity is not potent, phallic and domineering, but gentle, caring and tender. Ross's face is obscured, buried in the body of a cat. He's shirtless, maybe nude and face down, vulnerable, even penetrable. A vulnerability that is echoed in the fragility of the puzzled's form. Whatever this love is, this beautiful thing, the pronounced etchings of each puzzle piece remind you that this too will fall apart and fall away. Already four years before Ross's death, Felix had begun to constitute and then destroy his partner in his work as if rehearsing for and preparing him for the unthinkable and the unsurvivable, the time after Ross's loss. Yet he did so with a medium, the puzzle, that could be reconstituted and brought back together after its seeming destruction. There is a kind of cruel temporal paradox at play. The lover knows that the love object will leave them and so destroys the affair before the affair can destroy the lover. Engaging with this relation between destruction and perpetual reanimation, uh, the work confronts loss, the loss of Ross, by continually reproducing it, forestalling the loss only by perpetually placing the artist in the moment before the work's destruction and disappearance. Uh, Felix further elaborated on this dynamic in another passage from his interview with Spectre, and here he was talking more broadly about his practice, not about this specific piece. Um, this work originated from my fear of losing everything. The work is about controlling my own fear. My work cannot be destroyed. I have destroyed it already from day one. The feeling is almost like when you are in a relationship with someone and you know it's not going to work out. From the very beginning, you know that you don't really have to worry about it not working out because you simply know that it won't. The person then cannot abandon you because he has already abandoned you from day one. This is how I made the work. This is also a very accurate description of gay dating. Um, sorry. Uh, that is why I made this work. This work cannot disappear. This work cannot be destroyed the same way other things in my life have disappeared and have left me. I destroyed it myself instead. It's important for me to emphasize the way he says it was a fear of losing everything, everything, not just Ross, everything, himself, his world, everything. Felix had to learn to live with loss, with the loss of everything from an early age, when the forces of historical rupture washed across his childhood in Cuba, sending him jettisoning into the world without his parents or his sister. At a young age, he lost his home and his parents not to be re reunited with his family for years. While I have been suggesting that this discourse on loss has a particularly queer valence grounded in the forms of queer loss produced within the first wave of the AIDS pandemic as it decimated communities of gay men, trans folk, and black and brown people in and beyond the US in particular, I want to insist that there are other dynamics of loss at play here, tangled up in the histories of colonialism, revolution, migration, and racialization that accompanied Gonzalez Torres's trajectory north. In 1987, Gonzalez Torres produced another puzzle piece, untitled Madrid 1971, which consists of two puzzles in plastic bags. And I should uh, clarify that this piece was produced before Lover Boy, the piece I was just discussing. Um, here we find an image of the artist as a 13 or 14 year old boy and a photo of a statue, possibly in Madrid. A reference to his journey into exile from Cuba, the photograph has the air of a documentary photograph for a visa or passport, lending it a narrative of transport, movement, and possible becoming, even a process of becoming brown as reflected in the tan tints of the image. Despite the lightness of the little boy's skin and despite the contingent but favored status that has been offered to the Cuban American diaspora by the US state, People like this kid are nonetheless often made to be brown, especially when confronted with the sharp white background of the dominant culture within the US. The brownness of the photograph recalls Jose Munoz's description of the sense of brown as a kind of commons formed by overlapping histories of colonialism and racialization and migration. From Munoz, 
Brown is not strictly the shared experience of harm between people and things. It is also the potential for the refusal and resistance to that often systematic harm. Brownness is a kind of uncanny persistence in the face of distressed conditions of possibility. And that was a quote. Um, it is this uncanny persistence of living on after and before great loss that I want to linger on in this piece. In Untitled Madrid, racialization, diaspora, and migration are staged as a fragile balance between persistence and ongoingness, between fragmentation and loss, holding it together and making something beautiful. This is a performance of queerness and brownness as uncanny persistence or living on after loss in spite of the seeming impossibility of such things. The fragility of the puzzle becomes an apt means for producing work that could threaten to dissolve and destroy itself while also bearing the potential for reproduction and reparation. By drawing Untitled Lover Boy and Untitled Madrid into relation with each other, I mean to underscore the intimate and interwoven dynamics of love, loss, and living at the heart of the forms of queer migrancy and queer Cubanidad performed by Gonzalez Torres and within his work. This is a dynamic that is also described by one of Felix's other great loves, his friend and gallerist Andrea Rosen, who insisted that his work's confrontation with death and loss should not be mistaken as given over to the nihilistic inevitability of death but instead to the paradox that comes with living after the loss of love with, simply put, living on or continuing to live past the unsurvivability of love's loss. In confronting Ross's death, Felix was also confronting his own and with it, the full extent of his desire for life. Disappearance was not Felix's final goal. Absence became a way of confronting the essence of longevity it is extremely clear that Felix focused on creating systems to ensure that the work did not disappear permanently. The candies always have the possibility of being replaced endlessly. What emerges is what the work, uh, what emerges is that the work is less about the self-aggrandizing implications of immortality than the desire for a continuation of life. As his work carries with it the possibility of being endlessly reproduced, replaced or reconstituted, it also has structured into it the inevitability of the work's loss, destruction, and disappearance. In other words, Felix was teaching us that to live on, one must also experience the presence of absence, of loss, of love, the very thing that threatens to destroy the lover. This is to be terrified of losing that love. Untitled Perfect Lovers, 1987 through 1990. How does one confront and make a peace with that terror? In 1988, Felix composed a letter to Ross, counseling him on precisely this question. The letter seems to reference one of the artist's most celebrated works, a piece so iconic that it's nearly a cliche to mention it in a talk on Felix and love, but how could I not? Two clocks, side by side, perfectly kept in synchronous time. If one of the clocks falls out of time with the other, or if its batteries fail altogether, the work is deinstalled until they can be brought back into sync and hung on the wall. A portrait of homos, a kind of abstract sameness, but also of the melancholic defiance of the theft of time. The letter Felix wrote itself is composed on a typewriter. Above it, embossed in blue ink, is a portrait of two clocks. The letter reads, lovers, 1988, don't be afraid of the clocks. They are our time. Time has been so generous to us. We imprinted time with the sweet taste of victory. We conquered fate by meeting at a certain time in a certain space. We are a product of the time. Therefore, we give back credit where it is due, time. We are synchronized now and forever. I love you. Here, I'd like us to think back on what he said to Rollins one last time. Love is very peculiar because it gives a reason to live, but it also gives great reason to be afraid, to be extremely afraid, to be terrified of losing that love. I think also about how queer love is often lived on the time, time that is running out, as it was for Felix and Ross. Untitled Rossmore, 1990. When people ask me, who is your public? I say honestly, without skipping a beat, Ross. The public was Ross. The public was Ross. 
For five months in 1990, Ross and Felix lived together in Los Angeles at the Ravenswood Building on Rossmore Avenue. In, Los, uh, in Rossmore Avenue, their world was full, but Ross was dying. Felix later drafted a list of his primary impressions of that time, writing, 1990, moved to LA with Ross. He was already very sick. Harry the dog, Biko and Pebbles, uh, those are the cats. Um, the Ravenswood, Rossmore, Golden Hours, Anne and Chris by the Pool Magic Hour rented a car, money for the first time, no more waiting on tables, Golden Girls, great students at CalArts. Um, Anne, his friend and curator, Anne Goldstein, also lived at the Ravenswood. When Felix was looking for a place to live, she recalled that he, quote, immediately was drawn to the name of the street, Rossmore, Rossmore, more Ross. Further describing their time in LA, Felix wrote, LA, 1990, Ross and I spent every Saturday afternoon visiting galleries, museums, thrift shops, and going on long, very long drives all around LA, enjoying the magic hour when the light makes everything gold and magical in that city. But this world was falling apart. Ross was dying in front of my eyes, leaving me. The golden hour, a burst of the sun's final embrace of Los Angeles, this was, for Gonzalez Torres, a time charged with the possibility of renewal and life's continuation. Recalling her sense of distant intimacy with Gonzalez Torres, Miwan Kwan, the art historian I mentioned earlier in the talk, recalls a snapshot that Felix gave to Goldstein and her partner, Christopher Williams. And this image is not that snapshot. This is just a photo I took in LA, but one can imagine the snapshot. Um, there, the words, a possibility of renewal, a chance to share a fragile truce were scribbled, and now this is Kwan's words, on the backside of a snapshot taken by the artist of the Hollywood Hills at sunset. It is a view through a window of a unit at the Ravenswood apartment building. The scene is of what FGT called the golden hour, the brief passage of time, a threshold moment when the final rays of the day seem to gently resist and acquiesce to the darkness that inevitably comes. Quan continues to describe the experience of driving down Rossmore Avenue and passing the Ravenswood apartment building as she conjures the sense of Felix and of loving Felix in the light of the golden hour. And this is Quan again. When I drive past Rossmore Avenue now, I imagine FGT's longing for more Ross. I also notice the light. It reminds me of the photograph I saw in Chris and Anne's living room of the golden hour upon the Hollywood Hills. I never saw Felix in this light but I know that others did. I know that he was loved in this light. The golden hour, and indeed the golden light of this golden hour, this time when day resists and acquiesces to the darkness that inevitably comes, was a central thematic through which Gonzalez Torres described the loss of Ross. During one trip to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, Felix and Ross encountered Ronnie Horn's Gold Field from 1982, a four by five foot sheet of golden foil. And it was for them, as he wrote, a new landscape, a possible horizon, a place to rest, an absolute beauty. That's the end of the quote. As they faced one ending, Gold Field opened up a space to rest, to take refuge in and to keep breathing. It was a place where they could stay still and quiet and alive together for just a minute longer. Um, he also wrote then, in the midst of our private disaster of Ross's imminent death and the darkness of that particular historical moment, we were given a chance to ponder on the opportunity to regain our breath and breathe a romantic air only true lovers breathe. In the wake of Ross's death, Felix made Untitled Placebo. Then, a few years later in 1993, he reproduced a derivative version of the sculpture shown here with candies wrapped entirely in gold foil, titling it Untitled Placebo Landscape for Ronnie. A light strand, two bulbs, sometimes wrapped tightly around each other, casting a soft light across the room. Eventually then one flickers out, leaving the other alone. Felix made the first manifestation of the light strand untitled March 5th, number two in the wake of Ross's death. March 5th was not the date of the work's production. It was Ross's birthday. When the light goes out, the piece is deinstalled until it can be reinstalled. After death, rebirth. When I first made those two light bulbs, he told Spectre, I was in a total state of fear about losing my dialogue with Ross but it was in making more work, including much of the work that I have discussed today, 
that he sustained and made more Ross, finding a way to be with Ross in the wake of Ross's departner, departure. Untitled Alice B. Toklas and Gertrude Stein's Grave, Paris, 1992. I'd like to begin by telling a story that a friend told me. Since this is a story from a friend, maybe I've misremembered it, or maybe it's not the truth, or maybe some details of it are off, but I like to think of it anyway. In the time after Ross's death, Felix was traveling in Paris with his friend, Julie Alt. They went to the famed Père Lachaise Cemetery to visit the graves, among others, of queer ancestors like Oscar Wilde, Gertrude Stein, and her lover, Alice B. Toklas. While standing at the grave of Stein and Toklas, González Torres took a photograph of flowers growing around the grave, which transformed into this 1992 sea print untitled Alice B. Toklas's and Gertrude Stein's grave, Paris. He exhibited it as a photograph a number of times between 92 and 94. In 1993, he published a book, including the interview with Rollins, uh, with which I began this talk, as well as photographic reproductions of a host of his works, including images of Ross, reproductions of source material and other inspirational matters, including a passage of the script synopsis from Hiroshima Mon Amour by Marguerite Dura. The cover of the book was wrapped in the photograph of Stein and Toklas's grave, both a reminder of queer death, but also a reminder of queer love brought back together in the time after death as Toklas and Stein lay there together. Um, this is an image of an install of the piece um, in a recent um, uh, curated show of Felix's work by the artist Jan Vo, um, who is also sort of uh, reflected often on the dynamics of queer love and loss. Um, queer love, encapsulated in the form of lesbian herstory, is framed in this piece as a site of loss, and still from the grounds of this loss grows something beautiful. In saying this, I do not mean to say that the loss was worth it. I imagine if he had a choice, Felix would have traded every beautiful impulse that his love of, uh, that his love of Ross and that the loss of Ross inspired in him to have his partner back. In telling their story, or a version of their story, I do not want to over romanticize their attachments. Love stories are always more complicated than we want them to be, full of fragmentation, loss, brokenness, and even violences that we excuse or forget. By spending time meditating on the place of Felix and Ross's queer love story in Gonzalez Torres's work, my aim has, aim has simply been to grapple precisely with the underside of love, dynamics of loss, death, and terror that constitute the love relation and queer love in particular but also to attend to the way Gonzalez Torres modeled practices for confronting loss with a love that might live on in spite of its seeming destruction, a life that could live past death and through love. So to conclude, I should note that I would be remiss to tell this story without returning one final time to one of Gonzalez Torres's most elegiac portraits of love and loss, the 1991 billboard untitled. The billboard was first exhibited in 92 by the Museum of Modern Art for Projects 34, with 24 outdoor locations and one indoor installation at the museum. While writing for an exhibition pamphlet, the curator Anne Umland cited a passage from a Wallace Stevens poem, Final Soliloquy of the Interior Paramour, and the passage is, out of the same light, out of the central mind, we, might, we make a dwelling in the evening air in which being there together is enough. Umland then explains, and this is a quote, upon rereading these words in late 1991, Felix Gonzalez Torres realized that some deep memory of them lay behind his decision earlier that year to photograph his own empty double bed for Untitled. He discovered the poem in a book of Stevens's poems that Ross had given to him in 1998, the same year that Felix wrote to Ross not to fear the clocks nor time. Stevens's poem is a romantic description of the space lovers make together in the world. Felix included a reproduction of it in the 1993 book featuring a cover with the reproduction of the photograph of Stein and Toklas's grave and the interview he gave with Rollins. It's a lyrical hymn to togetherness and the quiet time spent still in the company of lovers while we still have time to be together. I think of Felix in his apartment with his cats and collections of figurines with space filled up with the loss of Ross. I imagine him taking the photographs of his bed while meditating on the passage, looking for another way to make more Ross and to keep alive a love that sustained him past loss. And so here, 
in this new era of great loss, but also great love, I conclude our time together by leaving you with Stevens's words, so beloved by Felix, the final soliloquy of the interior paramour. Light, the first light of evening, as in a room in which we rest and for small reason think the world imagined is the ultimate good. This is therefore the intensest rendezvous. It is in that thought that we collect ourselves out of all the indifferences into one thing, within a single thing, a single shawl wrapped tightly round us since we are poor, a warmth, a light, a power, the miraculous influence. Here, now, we forget each other and ourselves. We feel the obscurity of an order, a whole, a knowledge, that which arranged the rendezvous. Within its vital boundary in the mind, we say God and the imagination are one. How high that highest candle lights the dark. Out of the same light, out of the central mind, we make a dwelling in the evening air in which being there together is enough. Thank you, that's the end. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for your lecture, which has been very inspiring. Um, me, me, me gustaría eh, invitar a toda la gente que nos está escuchando a que ahora o cuando pase, pase un tiempo, porque ha sido muy estimulante toda la conferencia, nos pudiese, si queréis, pasar alguna pregunta o comentario en este foro, o ya he visto que Yolanda Nicolás en YouTube a, a, os ha invitado a que participéis o a que nos enviéis tanto alguna pregunta como algún comentario, ¿no? No tienen, no tienen el por qué ser preguntas o cuestiones. Eh, yo tengo unas cuantas pues, cuestiones o algunas preguntas, yo soy a que también en conversaciones con, con Tania Barson, ¿no? Cuando ella estaba preparando la, la exposición y, 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 bueno, y que ella es la que mejor conoce todo el trabajo de Félix, había una tensión, o a mí me parecía, tú has mencionado en tu conferencia en algunos momentos, y además tan, incluso en las propias palabras de Félix, la cuestión del amor romántico, ¿no? o el aire romántico que, hay en, que había en, en Los Ángeles. ¿no? A mí me gustaría como, bueno, tú, tú, bueno, tú sabes sin, sin lugar a dudas lo que desde los, la, las posiciones queer, se, han problemat se ha problematizado el amor romántico ¿no? o la cuestión romántica. ¿no? Entonces me gustaría eh, que si de alguna manera nos podrías como, bueno, explicitar o qué piensas tú de esta tensión que se da en el trabajo de Félix entre una propuesta radicalmente poética y política ¿no? desde posiciones queer con eh, lo que tradicionalmente hemos denominado o hemos entendido como amor romántico, ¿no? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I should say one of the things that I, and I'm sorry, I'm talking, I tend to talk very fast. So I've been trying to slow myself down uh, so the interpreters can catch up. And um, um, uh, so I should say one of the things that I, um, in writing the remarks for today, struggled a little bit with is the nervousness that it's a little too romantic or a little too soft because the conditions that led to both Felix and Ross's death um, are anything but romantic, right? We're talking about, um, you know, mass death that could have been um, prevented um, if uh, uh, both the state and the broader public um, had not been so hostile um, towards the populations who were vulnerable to HIV. Um, and um, Felix's work, of course, is just, as I noted briefly, trenchant in its critiques of, um, um, Uh, the sort of dominant political and economic orders that he was navigating um, and that his affair with Ross was um, being lived under. Um, you know, and I make the note, for example, about the fact that immigration laws didn't even recognize their relationships. So they were kept um, often in separate places. And what we see are these moments when they could steal time together. So these five months in LA while, while Felix is teaching at, at CalArts um, or this trip to the lake or this trip to Europe. Um, um, but the structural conditions really um, uh, made their love affair just difficult as hell, one could say, right? Um, 
Uh, and uh, there is something I think in our sort of romance movie hearts, we find those kinds of stories even more romantic, right? The kind of false notion of love that overcomes all things. But in reality, this isn't a story about love that overcomes um, all obstacles because we lost both of them. Um, we lost Laycock and we lost Gonzalez Torres um, and their love, which has taught so much um, to so many of us, um, you know, they didn't get to can enjoy the continuance of it that gets reproduced in Felix's work, right? So one of the things I struggled with in writing this and emphasizing so much just a story about an intimate pair of lovers was that it was obscuring some of those details. And, and for example, in um, a number of the puzzle pieces, Felix really brought that stuff home, taking, you know, images of the US Supreme Court just after it had upheld anti-gay um, um, legislation. Um, or images of the Pope uh, uh, giving communion to a former Nazi, right? Um, uh, so I was worried about leaving those things out. But at the same time, um, one of the things that I did want to reflect on is something that often uh, I think gets uh, left out of even radical queer politics. Um, I think framing a queer politics against a kind of um, normal presumption of romantic love is a good idea. I think we have to do that. I think the narratives of romantic love are deeply problematic. They're deeply patriarchal, right? They're often designed to trap women and uh, uh, into sort of fundamentally abusive scenarios. And as queer folks inhabit those narratives, we also find ourselves foreclosed outside of them. But nonetheless, in our intimate and daily lives, um, we have these extraordinary and often very romantic love stories. And one of the things about um, Felix and Ross's love story is that um, it has always, for me, been a model of the possibility of a kind of loving and caring relationship that seemed impossible. And certainly that I was told was impossible growing up. So I first encountered Felix's work when I was 18 years old. Um, at that time, homosexuality was still illegal in 17 states in the United States. Um, I grew up in Colorado. Um, which was a pretty, you know, um, pretty homophobic space. And really the narrative I had been told my entire life is, you know, you will die and you will die alone and you will die young from AIDS. Um, and, and encountering Felix's work just as an 18, 19 year old and finding all these portraits of Ross, I was seeing something, you know, that I couldn't see anywhere else in the world, least of which from queer elders, because so many of them were, were gone at that time, um, which was this intimate portrait of two people loving each other and building a world for each other in spite of the impossibility of it. So in emphasizing the kind of intimacies um, that he gave us of their relationship, and I don't pretend to know anything about their relationship other than the material he gives us in the work and the things I project onto it. And he even invites us to project onto it, right? In still life, we have all that empty space where we can project our own vision of what that affair might look like. I hope to just sort of draw attention to some of those smaller everyday textures of queer living. Um, and I do think, you, you know, you can't see it, um, but I'm here in my home, which I share with my two partners, um, one who has the last name Gonzalez, although not, not of any relation. Um, and um, uh, we've been together for some time and they are my rock and we have lived with each other through this pandemic. We have lived through one of us contracting HIV a number of years ago. Um, and it is a kind of everyday, um, quiet, loving in the light that sustains us through all sorts of forms and loss. And I don't know that I would have been able to seek after a love like that if I hadn't encountered models like Felix's when I was younger. And I wanted to just sort of emphasize some of that. So I don't know if that makes makes sense, but I, I do want to definitely acknowledge the dis-ease that I have with romance and maybe say, like, maybe we can queer romance and make it a little queer while still being critical of it. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, 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 no that, that, was, that was great. That was great also to it. Uh, I, I, we have a comment here from Alex Martin. No? Like he says, bravo, thank you very much for this intimate and affective lecture on Felix. No? Thank uh, you. I have a, a, yeah, Tania is here. Hello, Tania. Hello, can you hear me? Um, Perfectly, yes. Yeah. I'm just sort of forming a question in my, in my in my mind at the moment, which is is perhaps in this dialectic of 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 love and loss that you have spoken about very beautifully and um, today, I wondered if you have an idea of where where the idea of um, commemoration or memorialization or the or the monument, which is so much a part of our present moment and how that 
those aspects intervene in this, in our own experiences, as well as Felix Gonzalez Torres's um, experience of love and loss and how that might impact on our, our view of, of, of his work, how those questions kind of arise in, in, in relation to the, the account that you've given of the work today. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, I think in so many, in, in, we have, in so much of the literature about Felix's work, um, commemoration and memorialization are, um, you know, often at the front, right, of, of the interpretations of the work. And um, it's interesting because the work itself both, uh, it has a kind of ambivalent relationship to memorialization. On the one hand, it is constantly creating a kind of memorial to loss. On the other hand, that memorial or those memorials are constantly destroying themselves and then replenishing themselves. Um, and then there is this other more critical um, angle around memorialization, um, which are the kinds of official forms of memorialization that he was incredibly skeptical of. So in Untitled Madrid, we see this little boy, right? And there is a kind of, um, we see a kind of memorialization of a story that is often obscured, the, the story of, of children who were sent from their home in Cuba, sent out into the world into often hostile places and had to make a way for themselves next to this sort of nationalist statue, which seems imposing and kind of terrifying. Um, and I can think of um, during the show, um, every week there is something different. Um, one of the sort of iconic moments in that show was when Gonzalez Torres erected um, a go-go platform and had a go-go dancer dancing in the space while surrounded by images um, of photographs of a monument to the president, Teddy Roosevelt, um, in the room. And I raised that in particular because, you know, um, uh, Roosevelt has uh, a complex history of uh, being entangled in, in colonization and certainly uh, that monument, which is at the Natural History Museum, which itself is entangled in histories of colonization and dispossession. Um, are you know sort of um, problematic, and I raise that one in particular because in the U.S. in the last year there has been a kind of ongoing debate around questions of monumentality, right? And here we see that underside to monuments that I think Gonzalez Torres was critical of, which is the way monuments are used to narrate um, um, the uh, legitimacy of the dominant power block. Um, so in the U.S. we have just everywhere. I mean, even in Chicago we have constant memorializations to nationalist American history, but it's often these kind of vaunted celebrations of people who like, you know, by today's standards, many of whom were just war criminals, right? <laughs> uh, throughout the US South, there are lots of monuments to um, the Confederacy, which, which um, uh, uh, fought um, uh, in defense of slavery during the Civil War. Um, and then, you know, throughout our cities, we have monuments to these leaders who are sort of set up as great men like Teddy Roosevelt, but uh, then may have, you know, owned slaves or slaves or, or played a role in the process of colonization. Um, and I think like Felix's entry into memorialization as a practice gives us a different model than the statue, right? Which is this kind of fixed patriarchal imposition of power as it narrates itself. Something that actually turns out to be quite flimsy once history and narrative start to shift. So for example, what seems like a beautiful statue to the Confederacy uh, last year during the uprisings um, after the death of George Floyd, um, I think it was in Kentucky, one of those monuments um, was defaced, covered in graffiti and became this beautiful, beautiful living symbol of the struggle for black life, right? The monument itself started to look like a real problem. Similarly, throughout the country, people started defacing monuments and some of these sculptures started to come down. Um, and there are all sorts of debates about what to do with them. But I think Felix gives us another approach, which is what about creating monuments that are themselves weak, that are themselves fragile, that refuse to some extent to be put in the service of the kind of imposing narrative of the state. And that might allow us to have a critical relationship to monumentality, that when that piece falls apart and breaks down and comes back together, we may not remember it exactly as it was, right? There's a, a sort of degree to which um, he's giving us, I think, a weaker practice of memorialization, um, one that may be less easily appropriated um, into nationalist narratives. Although, as a final note, I will say, I question even that less easily appropriated because of course, Felix represented the US at the Venice Biennale a number of years ago, and I remember quite um, distinctly that the letter for the appointment of representation for the Biennale comes with a kind of confirmation from the Secretary of State 
And I remember that at that time, Condoleezza Rice, who was the Secretary of State, um, who was prosecuting the Bush administration's um, uh, uh, diplomatic, profound destruction of entire regions of the world, was the person who nominated Felix. So here we see even the kind of commemoration of Felix as playing into the soft power of the US imperial machine. I don't know if that, that answered the question, but maybe. I think it, I think it did very, very, very well and, and somehow indicated how the work is very prescient for, for the present moment. And maybe this idea around how he offers us another kind of way of memorializing or monumentalizing or, 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 or commemorating something is actually more enduring in the end than, than those static patriarchal monuments and, and maybe even the fact that Condoleezza Rice had to sign that letter was somehow subversive as well that he was placed in that position and, and the show that Nancy Spector made for the pavilion was was yeah. playing with those questions around how to how to how to approach national identity and how to serve or subvert those yeah. things as well but anyway yeah. thank you very much no that was amazing. I mean, I I would just add on to that that I think um, I, I I the I totally agree about you know there being a kind of I think he was a really good model um, of how one works within power structures right that are um, even hostile to one's existence right. So there was a kind of pleasure in seeing that Condoleezza Rice leather right. There's also the kind of rage because it's sort of like ah uh, you know. <laughs> Um, this is not what the U.S. It, like Felix is not what represents the U.S. in the mid two thousands, right? Instead, we should look at actually graves. Like that's what I think represents the U.S. in that period. But I think in in um, you know in even uh, in the pavilion, right? Um, one then can come into and engage in a pedagogy that gives us another model, or another way of being, or another way of practicing. And I think some of the the lasting endurance of Felix's work um, is that. It, it plays on a kind of deep knowledge, which is that if we actually embrace, um, this is like a Buddhist thing, right? If we embrace loss, if we embrace death as part of something that constitutes our living, we might actually be able to live in more functional ways. And that monumental sculpture is a, precisely that attempt to kind of have an immortality that Andrea Rosen gestures to that's problematic, right? That there are other ways to have memorialization that's not about singular immortality. Eh, yo no sé si hay más preguntas del, del público. O, eh, hay una parte de tu conferencia importante, en la primera parte has estado hablando del tiempo y de la temporalidad ¿no? en el trabajo de Félix. Y me gustaría un poco eh, vol volver a, a eso y a todas las cuestiones relacionadas con la temporalidad queer frente al tiempo reproductivo. ¿no? o al tiempo lineal heterosexual, ¿no? o, o, o eso eh, que también eh, Esteban Muñoz llama, ¿no? la, la tempo, esa temporalidad queer del de allí y entonces. ¿no? Y, y me gustaría un poco también pensar en relación a lo que Félix, que también has mencionado en tu conferencia, eh, no sé si es una pregunta muy abstracta, pero la apuesta de Félix por la eternidad o por el infinito, ¿no? Y, y son como, me, me, me parece interesante como pensar estas dos tensiones, una vez más, entre el tiempo eh, eh, reproductivo y lineal, y por otra parte ese otro tiempo circular o tiempo de la eternidad, ¿no? que, que está tan presente en el trabajo de Félix. No, no sé si puedes, como, como eh, bueno, eh, yeah. andar un poco en eso o comentar algo en relación a, a, esa, a esa cuestión. Yeah. So, um... A couple of things, right? I made a mention earlier to queer time not being linear, which is a kind of passing moment. And I'm, and you've picked up here that this is sort of grounded in the broader discourse um, uh, and in the work of a lot of other thinkers who have thought about time and queerness. Um, and thinkers like Munoz have, have really pointed, and I actually, sorry, I also would add um, that I'm also deeply influenced here by um, thinking about race and in particular black studies, which also thinks about the kind of non-linearity of black time. Um, and, uh, and we could also think about this in relationship to colonial time and decolonial time. Um, the so the first thing I will say is that, you know, the standard definition of time is as linear time, progressive time. And I always think of the kind of like 
big daddy version of that as uh, uh, Hegel's philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy of history, in which he describes time as a kind of progress, right? A perfection of um, God's ideals for the world. And literally that you have, you know, historical progress as perfecting and moving towards something better. And this notion of a kind of linear progression um, has been used to justify all sorts of colonial violence across the world, right? It is, I don't say that with a kind of laughing to make light of it, it's just actually appalling. Um, um, that it uh, uh, that the notion of a kind of linear normal temporality um, gets applied to people's lives in really profoundly damaging ways. So for example, um, the notion that one is going to grow up, fall in love, get married, have children, raise those children, and then die, um, which is the kind of norm normative framework of the heterosexual family life, um, is one that can be profoundly damaging to queer subjects who don't necessarily live on that timeline, right? Um, um, so there is that right there, that I think the notion of linear time itself is a kind of problem. One, because I don't actually think time is linear. Like uh, the best, quickest way to say this is there's a great line in Freud where he says, you know, the unconscious is atemporal. Um, it has no temporality. And uh, the way we experience life is often not as linear as we think. We're constantly jumping through time, right? It's one of the things I love about the aesthetic and aesthetic encounter is that like, you know, the whiff of a piece of food cooking, um, a, just a strand from the perfect song can jump you in time. And suddenly you're like, you know, back in your parents' kitchen as a kid, right? So we don't really experience time as linear. We're often moving through past and moving through the future. And, and so many of us have experienced grief this year um, because of COVID and other things. I've lost uh, both my grandparents and an aunt. And one of the things about grief is that it is an incredible experience of time travel, right? Um, you're sitting there and you're thinking on someone and someone suddenly you just have the visceral feeling that you are in the past, right? Thinking with them. And I think this is one of the things that um, queer life insofar as it has had to face um, uh, um, all sorts of forms of annihilation and destruction um, that tether and weave grief into some of the um, fabric of, of queer life, of a life that refuses or does not live on a normal timeline, um, can open up all of these um, different temporalities and different possibilities for temporality, right? Um, one might have reproduction that doesn't have to be familial reproduction. I, that's one of the, I always liked the idea that, that gays recruit people to be gay, because I'm like, that's how we reproduce, right? It's not like like queerness doesn't reproduce, it just doesn't happen through sort of necessarily biological metrics. Um, so one of the questions is what, you know, what does one do with that when we stop thinking of time as linear? Um, what kinds of other possibilities for being in the world and being in relationship to each other do we have? What kinds of other ethical commitments do we have? For example, if the history of colonization is one that spans over hundreds of years, how do we deal with the way in which that history crashes into our present? What kind of, you know, um, right now I'm on unceded territory, right? That is still occupied um, uh, the land of the Ashinaabe as well as other um, tribes um, that had lived, um, indigenous folk that had lived in this region. Um, what does it mean to acknowledge that maybe the time of the present in which this is Chicago is incoherent with another temporality, right? A decolonial temporality. And I think that what Felix's work does is it gives us an opportunity of time as reorganized in different ways, right? And uh, here I think he's really harnessing what performance can do in particular, because I think performance has a unique way of allowing us to time travel. Um, in the theater, it's one of the few places where you can walk into a room and someone like walks on stage and says, we're in Denmark in the 17th century. And you're like, yeah, okay, I'm in Denmark in the 17th century, right? If even for the moment you kind of time travel. And I think Felix created works that um, uh, access performance's capacity to allow us to move through time, to give us a different sense of a queerer temporality that maybe isn't linear, um, that Ross has died, but Ross is still coming back to him in the work, right? That when we encounter one of the portraits of Ross, we get not the actual reality of Ross back, but some fragment of his life becomes animated in our present. And I think when we're dealing with forms of mass grief, um, developing skills for being able to time travel, to bring the past into the present and the future into the present so that we can open up other possibilities for being becomes really necessary. And, and um, Felix's work, I think, models a certain kind of practice of that. So I don't know if that answered some of the question or... 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. Mm. For sure. Okay, I see the question, yeah. question from Douglas. So if you can read the loud voice, if you want, of course. For sure. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, so the question, given the current acute problems of homophobia, racism, vaccine inequality, and other other things currently discussed, how can uh, we use the love and comparison effects that you have described in FGT's work into a, uh, more of a space of praxis beyond theory? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, one of my favorite, 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 favorite Felix um, texts is a speech that he delivered, I think in 1992, I think it was at the Ford Foundation. And he gets up and he talks about what he calls a cultural division of labor, where he's like, artists are expected to talk about expression and form and medium. And he's like, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. He's like, artists, what I want you to do is get up and give lectures on the savings and loan scandals. I want you to give lectures on, you know, legislation that is screwing people's lives over. I want you to give lectures on the um, uh, raising infant mortality rates in the United States, right? He like really names it. He's like, I, like, take your platform and use it to do insurgent political critique, something that I kind of did the opposite of today. Um, uh, so actually not the opposite of. Um, so I, one of the things I love about him is this kind of almost unreasonable position of, right? Like don't get up and talk about your work, instead get up and use the platform as a way to um, do ideology critique and to critique the power of the state. Um, but I think that call, that call to constantly be conscious of the political, social, and economic conditions that we're living within, um, and to think about what the role of art and aesthetics may play um, in navigating that is um, as important today as it was when Felix was working. So I think about a couple of things. One is just that I think right now in this moment um, where uh, I mean, I don't really even know how to describe it. We've all been cut off um, from each other um, over this period, but you know, things have been real messy in the United States. I don't know if you've seen it on the news, but we've had a, we've had a special year in terms of our politics, and there is a kind of I think continuing question of like, does the republic still exist as we as it was understood to exist? Is it transforming into something else, something much scarier? Um, uh, the necessity for like trenchant political intervention is necessary. But also with that, given the extraordinary amount of death, um, the necessity to be able to work through all the forms of loss and grief that come with a pandemic, with um, the shaking of the foundation of uh, a certain kind of idea of a nation, um, with the ongoing forms of um, uh, uh, racial violence that serve as the foundation of the United States, um, requires a kind of working through of those things. And I think that Felix's work could provide spaces in which we could enter into those questions and work through those questions in ways that are actually contemplative, thoughtful, powerful, and non-abusive, which, you know, to Tanya's point, is shockingly relevant in this moment where political discourse, especially in the United States, has just like it's really dissolved to the level of like people fighting in the streets. I don't know how else to describe it. Like people don't really have political debate in the US anymore. We're just arming up. There was an article in the New York Times the other day about how there's, I think one handgun per American right now um, in the country, but that's disproportionately held on particular sides of the political spectrum. So, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but I think the, the response here is to say that what I think Felix's work gives us is a space to enter into um, relation with these questions, and then to pose for ourselves the question of uh, what is to be done, right? So that note about Felix giving the lecture and saying, okay, and then get up and give the political critique, that question of what is to be done is placed back on us. And the choice of what actions we make, um, what kinds of political moves we engage with, um, sorry, that's my dog, uh, uh, is, is, is put in our hands. I'm going to open the door and let him out. Hey, let me put him outside. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. Yes, 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 I'm sorry. Um, so let me just conclude that thought without dog uh, interruption. Um, uh, I th the simple way of saying it is I think his work gives us an actual space to work through that question. How do we engage in the political and what kinds of practices can we develop for engaging in the political that don't have to be reduced to the kind of sheer violence in the streets that has become one of the dominant forms of political discourse in this contemporary moment. And sorry for the dog interruption. 
and the fast speaking. Okay, thank you, uh, Joshua. I don't, I don't think if uh, do I have time for one more question because the translation is out of time. I think I, I want to check YouTube, but there is no other question. So if there is no other question, we can. So Joshua and. Tanya and all, all the, the people that are attending this, this lecture that after this will be online. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much, Joseph, for this inspiring lecture that is a food for thought for, for, for the rest of the exhibition and also to come back to, to your lecture. So thanks. Thank you. It's like, it's been like the highlight of my month looking forward to this while the month just started, but I've been looking forward to this so much. I'm very excited about seeing the show later this summer. Um, and it's such an honor to be here with you thinking about this important work and this important show. So thank you very much for that and for putting up with all the tech and dog weirdness. <laughs> okay, okay. So, chao. Al, al resto de, de la gente nos vemos el miércoles que viene con Cabello y Carteller en el auditorio del MACBA y también aquí online. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotras.